If you've used MS-DOS in the past, you're probably familiar with this character. This is the pipe symbol, and it's incredibly useful. It allows you to pipe or send the output of one program to another program. This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later. If I were to enter type readme.txt into this computer, it would spool out a huge readme file, giving me no time to read it. However, if I were to enter type readme.txt pipe more, the output gets sent to the more command, which handily breaks the document down into screen sized chunks. But there's an issue with this pipe symbol, and the issue is. Well, it doesn't actually exist, well, not in this context, and what's more, there are often two apparently identical instances of it on keyboards, neither of which are existing in the way they're supposed to. Allow me to explain. For centuries, mankind has been using code to communicate, but it was really the telegraph which set a standard for a universally understood binary type communication with the International Telegraph Alphabet. This used five pulses of electricity to encode the letters of the alphabet and various other figures, so they could be successfully decoded at the opposite end. Computers also needed character codes, so that data could be sent, processed and stored in the computer's memory. The problem was, by 1960, there was at least 29 different code standards being used by computers. IBM, for example, even had multiple character codes used across their own systems. Some standardization was needed, just like the telegraph, although that couldn't be adapted for computers because if you arranged the signals in binary order, it just produced a complete mess. And so, the American Standards Association, the ASA, began the process of character code standardization on the 4th of August 1960, creating the X3.2 subcommittee for coded character sets and data format. By March 1961, an initial code was produced. This one. 54 characters arranged across 4 columns and 15 rows. This gives you a maximum of 60 characters, which fits into 6 bits, so it's a 6-bit code. Going from this example, T is column 3, which is 1-1 in binary, and row 7, which is 0-1-1-1, giving a binary code of 110-111 for T. Of course, at this time, punched card was used for entering data, so this would be represented by two punched holes, one space, and three more punched holes. This is also why we have null at the start of the table, as that leaves all holes unpunched, binary 0000000, 000 000, and delete at the end of the table, as that punches all holes, removing any data that was present, binary 1111. One, one. However, that's not what the binary code for T is actually today, and you'll notice that a lot of the characters we use today are missing from this table. The lowercase alphabet for starters. Therefore, it was decided in May 1961 that a family of related codes of different sizes would be created. A 4-bit numeric set, a shifted 5-bit set, a 6-bit set for data processing, a 7-bit set for communications, and the possibility of an expanded 8-bit set. The 7-bit set was identified as the prime set for information exchange. So this is the initial 7-bit set from the 1st of June 1961. Already it's very different from the first. It's also the first where we see the pipe symbol, or vertical line. The reason for its inclusion is that it's actually the logical OR symbol, and therefore grouped among other mathematical symbols such as greater than, less than, logical not, you get the idea. However, this table, this code, gave minimal concessions to keyboard design. For instance, if two symbols reside on a key, ideally you want them in the same row, because it equates to only a single bit difference between each character. This allows the keyboard to be mechanically simpler. 
You have to remember that at this point, Hollerith or mechanical keyboards were often used to physically punch data into card or tape to be fed into the computer, and so this character set lacked elegance and practicality. And so, in collaboration with other global standards authorities, including the UK and Europe, the arduous process of determining a satisfactory 7-bit standard began. Now, I won't bore you with each subsequent revision, but I can tell you that it would take another six years before the standard was agreed, with the vertical line phasing in and out of existence throughout. By the 12th of May 1966, we had this setup, which looks much better with corresponding shifted values in the correct rows and the ability to create subsets of the main set. The idea here was that the four middle columns could be taken as an international subset and used on 6-bit machines, leaving some of the outside characters as part of the greater 7-bit set. Some of these outlying characters could also be repurposed as part of a national set for localised accents and other requirements. Based around this draft, the International Standards Organisation would draft this proposal. You can see some characters are designated for national use. We also have a pound symbol where hash was, giving you some idea as why Americans refer to the hash as the pound symbol. However, even though this draft had international approval, it caused some upsets, mainly with an IBM user group known as SHARE. The chairman, H.W. Nelson, would pen an irate letter to the ASA entitled the proposed revised American Standard Code for Information Interchange does not meet the requirements of computer programmers. His point was there weren't any characters in the international subset that could be used to satisfactorily represent the logical operations of OR and NOT. His proposal was that the code table be arranged like so with the vertical line or logical OR at position 2, 3 and the NOT or NEGATE symbol at 2, 4. This would allow for operation of programming languages such as IBM's Programming Language 1 universally and on a wider variety of systems. But as the original ISO draft had already been accepted, changes would be difficult, so a compromise was made. Both the circumflex and exclamation mark would need to allow the ability to interchange with the logical not and logical or symbols respectively, as if they were some kind of shapeshifters. So in some uses, such as programming, pressing these key commands would create logical symbols, and outside of programming or on a different machine, they would produce their original symbols. In an attempt to appease this significant and important programming community, the standards document was annotated as thus. It may be desirable to employ distinctive styling to facilitate their use for specific purposes, as for example to stylize the graphics in code positions 2.1 and 5.14 to those frequently associated with logical OR and logical NOT respectively. The original vertical line found in 7.12 was then broken, so that users would not mistake it as the logical OR symbol, which would then create an erroneous output. And the ASCII character codes were formed, so this broken bar would become ASCII character 7C, and you get that with the formula 16 times X plus Y, where X is the column number and Y is the row number. That gives us 124, which is 7C in hex. Which brings me on to my sponsor, Squarespace. Now, this is my last slot in this run with Squarespace, so I want to give them a big thanks for supporting me and frankly allowing me to upgrade some of my videography equipment. Look out for some improvements in future videos. But if you want to create your own website for well, any purpose, be it business or pleasure, Squarespace has your back. It's incredibly simple to get a website up and running with a custom domain using their platform, with effortless tools and guides to help you along. And right now you can grab 10% off your first purchase by visiting the link in the description. 
squarespace.com slash nostalgia nerd. But remember, this is the last sponsor segment in this run, so don't hang about. Check them out with the link below. And so, on the 5th of July 1967, this would become the American Standards Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII, with the equivalent ISO 464 code published as a recommendation in December of the same year, ensuring that text remained readable and usable across multiple machines. So, all fonts going forward would be created around this code set, with the keyboard interface generating the correct signals to call the relevant characters up from ROM or software. So, this explains why we have our broken vertical bar on the keyboard, and indeed, why it appears in our software. It was part of the character set from 1967 onwards, but as it was no longer needed for its original operation, computer programs began repurposing it for their own uses. So going back to our initial example, this is how DOS ended up using it for the useful pipe command. Although, like a lot of things, really, it was stolen from Unix, which had been using it since the early 70s. But something happened between 1967 and the release of DOS and the IBM PC compatible that should have had implications. Enter ASCII 1977. Yeah man, the 70s were a different, funkier time, and it meant that what was once taken out went back in. Yes, ten years on, and with the share group apparently a distant memory, ASCII 1977 went about undoing the compromises of the original ASCII 1967. The hash symbol could no longer be replaced by the pound, the circumflex could no longer be stylized as logical not, and importantly, the exclamation mark could no longer be stylized as a vertical bar. This meant the original 7C broken bar was repaired to be a beautiful, full-flowing, continuous bar. Yes, it was back in business again as logical or. Internationally, these had actually been done even sooner with ISO 646-1973. It seems like it really was done just to appease PL1 programmers for a few years. So enter the IBM PC in 1981, and enter Microsoft DOS. And what do we have? Yep, we've still got that broken bar. Here we have a character that does not conform to ASCII standards. This character should not exist, but yet it does there, it does here, and it does on almost every keyboard of the 1980s and 90s, or IBM PC compatibles at least. And in fact, still a lot of keyboards up until this day. But that in part is due to the IBM PC using its own character set. This is called Code Page 437, and should look pretty familiar to you. It's actually an 8-bit character set, it just does away with the extra 1-bit parity check used on the original 7-bit ASCII set, and gives us a load of graphical characters commonly used for DOS programs like Edit, ScanDisk, and QBasic. All the non-ASCII characters have bespoke numbering conventions to avoid confusion and interpretation issues. I mean, it is based on ASCII, it includes all printable ASCII character codes and extended codes, and it's sometimes referred to as High ASCII. I'm not sure whether that's because it looks like it's on drugs or not, but it's not strictly speaking ASCII compatible. And rather than pulling this solid vertical bar from 1977 ASCII, it uses the broken bar that IBM had been accustomed to since 1967. Now, if you're from the United States, or really anywhere else, you might wonder why it's down here. Well, that's because this is a UK keyboard. If you recall our earlier dollar symbol pound shenanigans, this is why UK keyboards are commonly 62 key rather than 61. The pound symbol is on 3, meaning the hash symbol is now on an extra key down near our larger enter key meaning the key you Americans usually have over the Enter key is actually now down here. And up there? Now oh god, what the hell is this? We have two vertical bars now. What is this? Two pipe symbols. What is going on here? 
Yes, UK keyboards have a second vertical line to the left of the one key. It's shared with that logical not symbol and a grave accent, used in various languages. If you're American and you have an international keyboard, then you'll find the second vertical line on the same key as the first vertical line. I'm not sure that makes it easier to comprehend, if anything, it's worse. Anyway, on a lot of character sets, these two symbols will look identical. The original pipe is ASCII 007C, whilst this new one is 00A6, and it's accessed on a UK keyboard using the ALT graph and the top left key. The reason it's here is due to the extended ASCII codes introduced in 1985 with ISO 8859-1 or ECMA-94. Also known as Latin 1, it consists of 191 characters from the Latin script. And under DOS it was introduced with code page 850. You can see how it fits alongside the original 7-bit set nicely. With it, this character set reintroduced back the broken vertical bar. Yes, the bar that was broken in 1967 to stop it being used the wrong way was brought back. I guess people missed it. But this new broken vertical bar is a different character to 7C, so it doesn't really have any purpose other than to look like a broken bar. Which, ironically, is what 7C still looks like in a lot of fonts and on a lot of keyboards. I guess it gives you an extra tool for ASCII art at least. So if you find an international or UK keyboard from 1985 onward, you'll likely find it has two solid bars, or perhaps two broken bars, or even more weirdly, it will likely have a broken bar where the solid bar should be, and a solid bar where the new broken bar should be. Things have switched around. In part, this is due to IBM's Model M keyboard. It was also introduced in 1985 and has switched the vertical bars, just like code page 437. It was also the basis for many keyboards going forward. Yeah, it's quite confusing. So, you may come across the odd font that still has the back to front implementation. Whether your keyboard has them the right way around will vary depending on your keyboard. Some will, some won't. It's amazing, as we're talking about a hangover from a standards dispute that now goes back over half a century. But regardless of how they look, the operating system should still recognise them as their original intention from 1967. You know, it should do anyway. So that's why we have two keys with almost the same character, and it's also why those keys, or the characters represented on those keys, shouldn't actually exist. Well, not in the way they're intended. So, as a recap, this key was once a broken bar, represented by a broken bar on screen, but it should have been a solid bar, represented by a solid bar on screen, and mostly these days, that is the case. This extra broken bar, located on some keyboards, that is sometimes portrayed as a solid bar, but is in fact a broken bar, was introduced in 1985 and is really just for old times sake, but is a distinct different character from the original broken bar, so doesn't really serve that purpose. Unless programmers give it a bespoke purpose, just like this one was. Maybe Unix can have an extra pipe. It does seem to like them, after all. Or maybe YouTubers can just use them in video titles, as a separation mark. So I hope that explains something you probably never cared about, or possibly made it more confusing for you. In any case, thanks for watching, and have a great evening. <laughs>